You may be seated. I tested for COVID this morning. I tested negative. So according to the Lexington mask mandate, I'm permitted to remove my mask right now for this sermon. And this is a bit in the way. Let's see if we can, uh, yeah, slightly better view. You know, it's what happens with uh, our technology. All right. Um, sometimes I find it enjoyable to read advice columns and try to predict the answer. I'd like to share a portion of a question that was published on Tuesday in the New York Times Magazine's The Ethicist. And I invite you to listen and think about how you yourself might respond. Here's just a section of the question. When my father died, the questioner writes, I inherited a large trust fund and sole ownership of the family business. I was young and woefully unprepared. So I put my inheritance on the back burner and lived my life as if I were financially normal. However, since the pandemic, my portfolio has hit a new high. I am utterly distraught. I feel that I should never have gotten so wealthy when people are suffering so much. And the questioner goes on to explain their specific question about how much money is it ethical to keep. Many of us may find it challenging to empathize with somebody whose distress literally comes from having more money than they know what to do with. But actually, there's something notable about this person, something positive, which can't be said of everybody. This person knows how lucky they are, and they don't attribute their good fortune to their capabilities or believe that they earned it or deserve it. Many of us in recent years have become familiar with the use of the word privilege to mean an advantage that a person or group of people may have that others don't by virtue of something that they don't control. People may have virtue, have privilege by virtue of being white or male or wealthy or able-bodied or conventionally attractive or by any number of other features. And these things help a person get ahead in ways that they didn't earn, but don't necessarily have control over. And most people have some things about them that give them privilege and some things that don't. The person who wrote this question recognizes that they did not earn their wealth and that this wealth allows them to do things that other people cannot. Many of us who have recognized the various privileges that we have, whether because of our race or gender or sexual orientation or socioeconomic status, may still be coming to terms with what it means that we have privileges that so many other people do not. This person recognizes their privilege and they feel guilty about it. But is guilt really the most productive way to respond to recognizing that one has privilege? This morning, we read about a person who had privilege a person who at first didn't realize it and acted in insensitive ways as a result. Joseph is a privileged person throughout his life, despite the fact that he experiences terrible suffering. Why do I say that Joseph is privileged? Everything comes easy to him. He's his father's favorite, but other people seem to like him as well, sometimes to his good, 
sometimes to his detriment. Think about it, Potiphar. Potiphar's wife, the jail keeper, Pharaoh's servants, Pharaoh. People seem to like him. And why? Well, he's physically attractive. He's very capable. He's smart. And he has a special something, something that the narrator and sometimes other characters try to capture by saying, God is with him. He didn't do anything to become so good looking and intelligent. And although according to a Midrash, by the way, he was somewhat enamored of his own appearance, uh, penciling his eyes and curling his hair. Um, But at the start of his story, Joseph takes his advantages for granted, and he is utterly unconcerned about the pain he causes to others. Rabbi Shai Held lists three sins of which Joseph is guilty. First, he talks about his brothers bringing diba ra'a, bad tidings of them to his father. Rabbi Held suggests based on other uses of the term, that these reports Joseph brought to Jacob, they may have been false and even malicious. Secondly, Joseph told his brothers not only about his first dream where they all bowed down to him, but his second as well. Um, That's not exactly sensitive behavior. (laughs) And Joseph's third offense is easy to miss, but crucially important. When Joseph comes to find his brothers, a trip that takes some time and work, he wears the beautiful ornamental coat that his father gave him as a sign of his affection. Why would Joseph wear such a special garment on this trip, a trip during which it could easily be damaged? Biblical scholar Joel Kaminsky speculates that Joseph may be intentionally flaunting his, this sign of his father's love in front of his brothers. One can imagine how it must have felt to the brothers, not only knowing that they were not their father's favorite, but seeing the evidence of it paraded so blatantly in front of them. Joseph may be privileged, but the advantages that brought him had its limits. As a result of his provocations, Joseph's brothers go too far, throwing him into a pit and selling him into slavery. Even there, however, his advantages help him get ahead. Potiphar elevates him to a position of power in his household. And even after that goes badly, Joseph eventually rises even higher to the second in command to Pharaoh. So did Joseph remain spoiled, oblivious, and inconsiderate? Or did his experiences teach him a lesson? Rabbi Held suggests that he did change and that the change began in prison. The first thing that changes in Joseph's behavior is the way that he talks. Until now, we have seen him speak and act thoughtlessly, even provocatively. But now in jail, the time when one might think he would most want to talk up his own abilities in hopes of using them to get out of jail, something changes. When Pharaoh's out of favor servants tell him that they have had distressing dreams, Joseph offers to help them but he doesn't credit himself with any special ability. Instead, he says, surely God can interpret. Tell me your dreams. And later, when Pharaoh tells Joseph that he has heard that Joseph is a master dream interpreter, Joseph corrects him, saying, not I. God will see to Pharaoh's welfare. For the first time, Joseph acknowledges that perhaps he should not take his gifts for granted. Credit is due elsewhere for the abilities and qualities that he has benefited from so far. In the same way that the person who wrote into the ethicist, 
recognized that they have privileges they didn't earn, Joseph too realizes and names the fact that his special ability was not earned. Acknowledging one's privilege, however, isn't the only goal. Once we recognize the privileges we have, we have the opportunity to use them on behalf of others. Kaminsky writes that Joseph comes to realize that his gifts are given to him so that he can be of use to others. Joseph begins doing just that in jail when he interprets the baker's and the cupbearer's dreams. He further uses his talents to help Pharaoh and ultimately to prevent an entire region from starvation. Now, I need to pause for a moment because I wouldn't take this interpretation too far. After all, jo Joseph uses his power in unsavory ways as well. When he plays psychological games with his, with his brothers, when he uses the famine to turn the Egyptian people into serfs, not a small thing. However, the seed of recognition is there and the outward focus on using his abilities to help others. By the way, the ethicist wrote a sensitive, I think, response to the questioner that I quoted earlier. He tries to help the writer recognize that there is no reason to feel guilty for having this money. And he encourages him to find ways to donate some of the money to help others. He suggests that the effort it takes to do so need not be seen as a burden, but rather as an opportunity. He says, you say you feel distraught. Let me urge another sentiment. The reaction of my family and me to our extraordinary good fortune is not guilt, Warren Buffett has said, but rather gratitude. You can free yourself from whatever part of your father's legacy you find burdensome. But the time and thought that it takes to make those necessary decisions should indeed be an expression not of guilt, but of gratitude. You don't have to be independently wealthy or amazing at interpreting dreams in order to have an unearned privilege that can be used to help others. Although we may be advantaged to different degrees, everyone has some amount of privilege, at least in some context or other. While Joseph needed to literally hit rock bottom in order to recognize the importance of using his unearned advantages to benefit rather than harm others, let's hope that the rest of us don't need to go through such a painful experience in order to have that realization. On this Thanksgiving weekend, let's notice what privileges and blessings we have. And instead of guilt, let's give thanks for our blessings. And then let's make sure that someone other than ourselves also gets to benefit from at least some of those blessings. Shabbat Shalom. We'll continue with the Musaf service. We'll invite Sarah Permusa to lead us beginning on page 184. Please rise if you are able for the Chatzit Kaddish. <laughs> Amen.